we, God's going to reveal himself in many, many ways. And you know, when he writes the letters to the churches, you have to remember that he's writing it for them back then, but, it's, but he's also writing it to us now. You know, the word of God is never bound by time. So as we walk through this, um, we are going to be encouraged, but we're also going to be very challenged. All right? Um, so... Revelation 2, the message of the church of, of, of Thyatira, okay? So if we go now, last week um, Andrew taught on the letter to Pergamon, that was which was phenomenal teaching. But tonight we're talking about Thyatira, and as you can see, it's one of the seven churches. Um, and you can see where it's in the map. It's between Pergamon and Philadelphia. And we're going to look at the background of it right now, which is really interesting. And as you're going to go through it, you're going to see how God is speaking to us regarding specific issues in our life. And so let's go ahead and get into the scriptures first, and let's just read them together. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Okay? So it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is a message from the Son of God whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance, and I can see your constant improvement in all these things. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from evil deeds, from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching, the deeper truths, as they call them, depths of Satan. Actually, I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority. I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word. You've got something for us tonight. And I pray as I unpack this, Father, it will be the heart of your Spirit. You will not only encourage us, but you'll also challenge us, Lord. And you'll let us know by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can become what you want us to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay. So, background to Thyatira. Okay. Located about uh, 45 miles southeast of Pergamon, as we saw on the map. His interesting thing was, is it's the smallest of the cities, but the one that received the longest letter. Guess who got the longest letter? <laughs> I did. Okay. It had no significant military, political, or administrative responsibilities. It was a prosperous trading center. Its most distinguishing characteristic was the large number of trade guilds or unions, this is going to be important, that flourished there. Everyone who worked there was a member of one or more of the trades, carpenters, dyers, sellers of goods, tent makers, and etc. And if you remember in the book of Acts, when Paul was in Philippi, he ended up meeting a woman named Lydia, who was a seller of purple, who actually came from Thyatira. Thyra, Do you remember that in the book of Acts? And they met her, actually met those women by the river, and they were praying, and he went up and ministered to her, and she realized she was a, a woman of God. But that's where she was, was, was from Thyatira. And here is the, the dilemma right now. Okay? It was difficult to make, living, to make a living as a Christian in Thyatira without belonging to a union. This is, this is a factor which will bear on the interpretation of this letter, as we will see. In order to work in these unions, which constituted the entire business of the city, Christians had to join a union or guild made up of pagans for the most part. 
These mandatory meetings were devoted to eating meat, which had first been a sacrifice to idols, and then they usually ended up involving sexual immorality. So you could see the tension that the Christians had to, had to be in in order to make a living. They had to decide, do I follow and stay in the guild, or do I follow biblical principles? Okay? So the first thing out of the gate, God says, Son of God. Okay? You'll notice this is the only time in the book of Revelation that the, we're Son of God. Jesus calls himself the Son of God. In fact, I believe um, in all the other letters he speaks of the characteristics of God. In this one he says Son of God, and I think there's a specific reason for that. You have Son of Man and you have Son of God. When Jesus speaks of himself as the Son of Man, he takes on the human part. The less deity person, the one who understands our weaknesses and all of that stuff. When he speaks of Son of God, he's speaking of his deity. He's thinking of his power. So when he's saying the message from the Son of God, he's saying, I'm coming with the one who is the Son of God, the all-powerful one, the omnipotent one, and you better listen, is basically what he's saying. Okay? He says, he stresses his deity. Um, he understands our struggles, but this is not what this, this church needs. This church did not need comfort by Christ. They needed correction. Okay? That's why it's one of the longest letters. He is speaking to the church as one with divine power and correction. Again, we get those two sides of God. And Jim and I were just talking about that before tonight. The Western church loves to see the God of grace. It's one of those divine challenges that we have, you know, grace and, and works and all those kind of things, faith and grace and all that. Here we have the Son of God and the Son of Man. And a lot of times the Western church, we want to see God as the loving, the forgiving, he's sweet, he's my friend, he's my papa, da-da-da-da, which he is. But we forget he's also a God of justice. He's the all-powerful, omnipotent one that we should have reverence for in our lives. And not just always lean upon all his grace all the time. Okay? He comes both ways. He's a two-sided coin. Okay? Here he's talking, I am the Son of God. Okay? I like this. His eyes are like flames of fire. He sees the deepest part of our heart. In other words, he sees right through us. He knows our thoughts and intents of our hearts. And he says later on in verse 23, Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or bad. Okay? Number one, God looks at us with penetrating eyes, which sees all things. Huh? You know, I love God... I love him with my heart, and I really like it when I know God sees what I'm going through. I can depend upon the fact that whatever's coming my way, God sees it and is already aware of it, knows it. He knows my struggles. He knows my pains. He knows when I'm crying out to him, even when I'm not yelling out to him. He knows it in my heart. But he also knows and sees the things I don't want him to see. <laughs> okay? You know, it's one thing to love that God that sees everything over here that's so comforting, but what about the God that also sees us when we're alone, maybe doing something we shouldn't be doing? And maybe if we got the idea that God is an all-knowing God that sees everything, it might not only give us comfort, but it, almost, all, it, all might, it might almost, I mean, it, it should also deter us mm -hmm. from specific things that we summon. Because, you know, we always think we can hide What's it say in scripture? It always says they, all, they always do the evil in the night. Because somehow you always think if you're in the dark, God doesn't see. More crime is committed in the nighttime than it is in the daytime. Because people think they can hide. We're the same way, brothers and sisters. We hide away when we want to do something that we don't want God, anybody else to see. But just remember, God sees what? All things. Okay? You spread out your sins before you, our secret sins, and you see them all. It's quite a deter deterrent, isn't it? 
For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharp as a two-edged sword, cutting between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. God will surely know, for he knows the secrets of every heart. A comfort and a deterrent. The human heart is most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine its secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to their actions that they deserve. God is an all-knowing God. I'm glad, he, I'm glad he is, but I want to also remember he's got the penetrating eyes. And he always is looking at us, not in a condemning way as believers, but he's looking at us saying, stop it. I see it, and I got something better for you. Right? Okay. Amen. His feet are like polished bronze. Okay, which bronze talks about judgment in the Old Testament, indicating strength for executing judgment. He's coming as the Son of God against this church because they're doing some stuff they shouldn't be doing, and he's coming saying, repent. Okay? And we're going to talk about later on about that. It's important. That's why he's not only called himself the son of God, but the penetrating eyes and the feet like bronze. Coming to talk to this church. But then our great God, who's so good, commends the church first. Interesting. Have you ever heard of the sandwich when you ever go to talk to someone? You always start with the positive, the negative. And the pot, anybody that teachers in there, that's exactly how you're supposed to present it to kids, you know, or, or even as parents. Start with a the positive, then bring the, the issue, the criticism, and then finish it with a positive. Kind of, it's what this letter is going to do. Okay, so he's starting with the positive right now in this church. It says, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance, and I can see your constant improvement in all these things, okay? Thyatira was different from Ephesus. If you remember, Ephesus started out with all these works, but they ended up growing cold, and they didn't have as many at the end. Whereas Thyatira showed progress and maturity in their faith that was evidenced by these particular traits up there, faith, love, service, patient endurance, etc., and continued in their faith. So if you were to look at this church, if a modern-day church, modern-day church of Thyatira would be great on the outside. It would be the church that someone might say, have you gone to Thyatira? It is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it is growing. It is bustling. You know, it's got, uh, I mean, they're just filled with love. You walk in there, you can just feel the love. They're serving. They're full of faith. They've been through stuff, and they're patient. You know what, brother, you got to go. Maybe you should leave that church and go to Thyatira. Okay? And not only that, as we get in later, you're going to love that teaching because, man, it makes you feel comfortable. Okay? And so, what were their commendable characteristics? Love, faith, service, patient endurance. Would, I mean, I, as Bethel, I pray that we excel in those. And I believe we do. Yes, sir. Okay? And, uh, and I don't believe we have the other thing that was going on at Thyatira. Thyatira. I just, these are phenomenal traits, and God is commending them for them. And they're growing, which is amazing. Okay? But the Christian life should never, as, as they were growing, the Christian life should never become what? Stagnant. It should always be dynamic and growing as we become like Christ. Um, guys, there's no neutral in the Christian walk. There's no coasting in the Christian walk. There's no place for it. You remember what Jesus says in Laodicea, as which pastor is going to be talking. He says, I wish you were either hot or what? Or cold. But because you're neutral, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. <laughs> Either a fireball, a snowball, or a spitball. You guys remember that, don't you? Okay? 
I always like to think of a Christian if you're on a greasy pole. You're either trying to go up it, or if not, you're sliding downwards. So if you think I can just, I'm just going to put it in neutral, you're going to go backwards. Okay? And we've all been there, right? We've all coasted on neutral because you know what? It's nice to be there. Oftentimes you don't have all the issues. You don't have the satanic attacks. I mean, it's nice. You just coast. Unfortunately, we have a lot of believers in our assemblies that sit as coasters. Okay? The hot coffee sits on them. <laughs> I saw where it came from. <laughs> okay? All right. So now he switches now, though. He goes, this is great. I love what you guys are doing. I'm commending you for this. Keep it up. Keep it up. But I don't like it when Jesus says, but. <laughs> Have you ever read it along? You just read it along and it goes, but. And you go, uh-oh. Here it comes. Here comes the punch, you know. Um, but I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that woman, okay. that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat foods offered to idols. Okay. Um, there is this lady. Okay. Now, most theologians do not believe that her name was Jezebel. She's symbolic for an Old Testament character that we're going to talk about. Okay. But, but she spearheaded. She had a leadership role in the church for sure because people were listening to her. All right? So she was calling herself a prophet. Okay? And she's, Jesus is calling out the church, you know, on, on the tolerating of the false teaching, the sac foods eat, uh, food sacrifice to idols, and sexual immorality. So who is this Jezebel? Okay? Well, first of all, she was probably the worst of all of the evil people in the Old Testament under the influence of the Jezebel spirit. We're not going to get into the Jezebel spirit, but you'll see that um, that's pretty much what it is if you look at some of the characteristics of her. In 1 Kings 16.31, she says she was the daughter of Ethbel. Hard word if I said it wrong. Um, Ethbael? Is that how you say it? Okay. King of the Sidonians who married Ahab, king of Israel largely because of her influence in seeking to combine the worship of Yahweh with the worship of Baal, it is said of her husband that he did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. That's pretty, that's a strong statement from God, huh? Okay. Jezebel used to, would spread the degraded worship widely among the ten tribes of Israel until one of the popular religions of the day, she was, herself supported 800 prophets of Baal who ate at her table. So not only did she sit down and eat, she, she invited the prophets from Baal to come and eat. Pretty evil. What kind of strategies were going on at that table against the people of Israel? Okay. She's responsible for killing of Naboth and confis confiscation of her vineyard for her husband. Her husband wanted the vineyard, okay? But, na but the neighbor wouldn't give it to him, wouldn't sell it. So basically Jezebel goes over there and just has him killed. Comes back to her husband, hey, it's taken care of. I wiped him out, the vineyard's yours, okay? And she sought the death of the prophets of Israel and even came close to killing Elijah. And if you remember Elijah on Mount Carmel, when he destroyed all of the Baal prophets, he ran because he had heard Jezebel was after him. Okay? So definitely under the influence of Satan, very evil, one of the worst evil spirits. And Jesus is saying to, that, to the church, you're tolerating the teaching of that woman, Jezebel. That's a strong criticism or complaint. Amen. So he has to come hard at him. Now you can see why I'm coming as the son of God. Okay? She calls herself a prophet. Okay, important here. It was not her gender that was the problem. It was her teaching. Okay? 
We know for a fact, if you read both the Old Testament and New Testament, there were many women prophets. Okay? Um, I think, I'm trying to think of, I know Philip in the New Testament, uh, the evangelist Philip had a bunch of daughters, uh, many daughters that were called prophets. Anna was another one. Um, what's the ones in the Old Testament? I'm trying to, Deborah, right. So God called many women to be prophets, all right? The problem with Jezebel was she was a false prophet, and it was her teaching. Paul said, I mean, Peter said in, in his letter, there are also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false prophets among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who brought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow the evil teaching and shameful immorality. So not only are there, and we're going to go down another road here in a minute, not, not only are there good, genuine prophets, there are also false prophets yes, today. And if you're not careful, you can be led astray. Amen. Okay? I have not sent these prophets, yet they run around claiming to speak for me. I have given them no message, yet they go on prophesying. If they had stood before me and listened to me, they would have spoken my words and they would have turned my people from their way, from their sins. Okay? Now, do you remember she said that woman who calls, what did she say? Calls herself a prophet. We don't call ourselves prophets. Who calls us prophets? God does. It's not our job to call someone a prophet. God is the one who calls them out to be a prophet. We just recognize the gift in them and bring it out. But you don't call you, oh, I'm a prophet. Okay? What was Jezebel's teaching? Remember we talked about the guilds? Okay? In order for Christians to make a living, they had to belong to the guild union. However, to attend the union and its mandatory meetings, they had to partake of eating foods that had been sacrificed to idols, which was against God's law and committing sexual immorality at the end of those meetings, okay? This woman Jezebel taught that it was all right for them to go along with the requirements of the guild, that they needed sub to submit to the pressures of the world around them in order to make a living. It would be okay if they disobeyed the Lord, he would understand and he would overlook it, okay? Modern day. Business is business. Have you heard this? If business practices collide with your Christian principles, then your principles have to go. You have to make a living. How many times salesmen, other people in different jobs, their superintendent or their boss will come up to them and they'll say, well, you need to lie about that product in order for it to get sold. What does a Christian do? That could mean their job, right. right? In this case, these Christians didn't want to lose their worldly advantage, so they went along with the teaching, okay? And so we have to be really, really careful when we're listening to a prophet or a teacher. This is important here. The existence of a counterfeit is never a good reason for rejecting the genuine. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I, that's, I didn't get that one yet. Should be this one there. I jumped ahead. Okay? Okay, so what's an exhortation here? We must not believe everything we hear, but we must test the spirit, right? There are going to be false prophets out there. There are going to be people coming with Jezebel spirits. There are going to be people that are very masquerading themselves as angels of light. Okay? He says, Dear friends, do, do, believe every, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. <laughs> I put do believe. <laughs> do not believe. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. What's the litmus test that we should have? Pastor Regan talks about it all the time when our, when our people get up and they prophesy. 
Number one, what is it? It's got to edify, it's got to exhort, right? And it has to encourage. Okay? Now, if you go back to Thyatira, you might have said, yeah, you can do this. That's why you got to use both. Because you might, yeah, you can do this. You can stay in the guild. It's okay. It'll build you up. Don't worry about the food sacrifice to idols and sexual immorality. You'll be stronger. You can hang in there. And you know what? I even have something better for you. You can make more money and give it to the church. Okay? Well, what's the second one? It's got to line up with what? The scripture. So just because you hear someone edifying, exhorting, or encouraging you may not line up with scripture. That's why you got to have both of them. So what does that mean? We got to know our word. Okay? You got to come to church on Sunday and hear our pastor teach and have people that have good biblical knowledge come and have good doctrinal foundation. Listen to them. Okay? By the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have that litmus test. Okay? And one of the most important things, really, I believe, is I don't think you're ever going to be duped. If you stay close to Christ, you're filled with the Spirit. Something's not going to be right when someone starts saying something to you. You're going to go, this doesn't sound right. Just stay filled and full of the Spirit of God. Amen. And you're going to be all right, I think. Which involves reading the Word, praying, going to church, <laughs> worship. Okay. So, the Christian must never... Um, the, the, I keep reading the one on the right. The existence of the counterfeit is never a good reason for rejecting the genuine. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, is Satan is phenomenal and very good at polarizing the church. What he would love to do is get just a few false prophets out there that just say enough crazy stuff that which has already happened in the body of Christ where generally most of the body of Christ runs from prophecy yeah. because they they've seen some really crazy stuff out there so what do they do they reject the genuine and I think that's why Paul came out in his letter in 1 Thessalonians when he says do not despise or scoff at prophecies but everything it is said Hold on to what is good. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will what? Prophesy. Young men will see visions. And then in 1 Corinthians, let love be your highest goal, but you should desire the special abilities in the spirit, especially the ability to prophesy. That's genuine. Okay? Genuine. So let's don't reject... Just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay? Let's be good. Let's be balanced. All right? It's the same with the gifts of the Spirit. All the gifts, the sign gifts. Something crazy goes on. So what, is it, what do all the churches say? Even some of the churches that believe they're not in sensationalists, they actually believe that the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is here today but they won't let it be exercised in, a, in an assembly because some crazy stuff has happened. So now they go, well, we're going we're gonna to shut it down, we're going to lock the doors, and we're going to control everything because we don't want anything weird to go on. They are rejecting the genuine. Okay? So let's be careful about that. Okay? Just a, a word of exhortation to... Um, okay, regarding the... the um, following the false teaching and number eight, the Christian must never compromise with evil. And that's what they were doing. They were compromising their faith in order to gain the world standards. Joyful are the people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws with all their hearts. Okay? And here's a good one. I like this one. I like that, Jezebel. Her teaching makes me feel good. Paul said, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will lead them, teach, tell them whatever their itching ears 
want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. That was the Thyatarians. Okay? They have found someone. Do we blame Jezebel or do we blame that maybe in their hearts they were a little bit too worldly minded? And so they found someone who would say exactly what they wanted to what? Hear. And that's why we got to be careful that we don't run from church to church to find someone who says exactly what we want to hear that makes us comfortable. Okay? God is not concerned about our comfort. He's concerned about our character. Okay? Did those in Thyatira who were compromising their principles stay in their, the state in their guilds have itchy ears? I would say they did. And Jesus is looking at them with those penetrating eyes and saying, listen. Okay? Okay. The things of this world and its central allurements must never take precedence to Christ and his word. Okay? Jesus talked about the people, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things would choke out the word. They lost how to handle the truth because they were going for the cares of this world. Number 10, we were made for what? Were they serving two masters in Thyatira? Yes. They were serving God and they were serving money. And Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You either got to be devoted to one or devoted to the other. Okay. Moving them. And lastly, regarding that, we must make every effort to live holy lives. Amen. Okay. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy, because without holy, holiness, no one will see the Lord. Put to death. That's a pretty strong word when you say put to death. I think that means making every effort. <laughs> make every effort. Put to death earthly things lurking within you, having nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, etc. Okay? All right. We're moving on in the, into the letter again now. Unrepentant sin will bring judgment. I don't want to hear that. Right? I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her morality. Though, therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from their evil deeds. I, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. Man, I see that right there. And, and the thing that came into my mind is in the book of Acts when uh, Ananias. Yeah. Boom, gone. Just like that. And we're going. And it said right after that in the scriptures, and the fear of the Lord came on everybody after that. Remember that? Okay. This Jezebel will be cast upon a, this is most likely a reference to personal sickness, disease, or physical affliction of some sort. And 1 Corinthians, we mentioned that they were mis, I mean, they were just not honoring the Lord's Supper. He says, for if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak, sick, and some have died. Okay? The word of God. It's the word of God. Okay? We need to take sin seriously. Okay? I love God. We can't ignore sin in our lives. We can't. It's very important. Um, God is either going to bring judgment against us or discipline depending upon our relationship with him. Yes, if you're not a son of God, if you're not a Christian, 
and again, if you're a Christian, and I, I, you know, I don't know where that all is. All I know is it says those that are drunk in immorality, et cetera, et cetera, will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, it's the word. And so the best thing to do is if, if God points out something to you that we know that's wrong, and I'm talking about myself too, is listen to him, hear it, and get out of it. Okay? Because he doesn't, God does not show our sin to discourage us. Okay? That's right. That's right. Um, yes, we need to deal with it, confess it, and move forward. Okay? And I love Hebrews. He says, For our first earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable. <laughs> Well, it is happening. It's painful. Uh, how many of us have been there? We all know that. And you're a liar if you don't have your hand up. No. But afterward, there will be peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained by it. Okay? God is more concerned about our character than comfort. All right? That's just that's the way it is. We will be disciplined. He's going to bring discipline against them. And basically, like if you repent, you're going to get disciplined. But if you don't repent, and you continue to go your way and live in morality, and you're not listening to me, there's another word coming. That's called judgment. Yeah. Okay. But here's our God's glorious heart. Right here. Is this not our God? He says, I gave her what? time to repent I love them when I read that and, let, and then later on it says unless they repent and turn away from their evil deeds unless they repent he didn't say I'm just going to get you I'm giving you time and Romans 2 4 he says don't you see how wonderfully kind tolerant and patient God is with you does this mean nothing to you can't you see that his kindness his delay, his patience, his tolerance is intended to what? Turn you from your sins. Aren't we thankful that God just doesn't blast us with the stuff we've been in? There was a time in my life, walking with the Lord closely, doing just on fire, and I made some really poor choices in my life, and I walked away. Now, believe me, his discipline came. But I thank God. God that he gave me time. Yeah. Amen. Did he give the prodigal son time? Yes. <laughs> but the problem is, we don't know how much time. We can't play that game. I thank him for that, but we can't go, well, I'm really living in sin right now, but I can wait a few months. God's patient. We don't know what the timeline is. And each individual may have a different timeline. Because yeah. <laughs> God knows everything about us. Yeah. So what's the best thing to do? Be quick to turn. Yes. Okay? Um, I love this one, too. Why is God taking so long? Because why isn't he bringing judgment against everybody or judgment against that person or more discipline or whatever? He says, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is just being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But, here's I was talking about that time, but the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. So if you're not repenting and you're kind of going, I know God's patient with me. It's all right. I'll be okay. I can live this way. He's going to come like a thief in the night. Do you know when it's come? Do you know when a thief is coming at night? You don't know it. It's unexpectedly. It would be the same thing for you. Okay? As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in, sorry, I didn't get a mistake, in no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. God's glorious heart. I mean, look at that. I mean, it's like commendation and then boom, here comes the complaint. 
But in that, in that, Jesus reveals himself in his heart. I'm giving you time. I think about the book of Revelation. If throughout the whole book of Revelation, when the judgments come, he's pouring all these bulls out and all that stuff, but at the same time, he's coming, repent, come back, come on. He just keeps waiting. He just keeps like, the angels are flying up in the sky and they're going, come on, turn to God, turn to God. His heart is always wanting you to repent and come back. But he is a God of justice and he will have to complete the justice. Okay. The proof is in the pudding. What is repentance? True repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of what? Action. Matthew 3, 8. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. It's not, it might involve that, but you can go to the altar and you can boo-hoo, cry, scream, fall down, shake, go home and bawl for 14 days in a row every moment. But if there is no change in your way you think or no change in your action, then it was just a world of repentance and it was not a godly repentance. Right. Amen. Okay? So you can walk up to somebody who doesn't even seem like they're sad. They just walk up and go, God, I'm really sorry for that. I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm turning. I don't need that. And the guys by the side of them are screaming and crying, Kleenex, and all the ushers are giving them Kleenex. And the, <laughs> and the guy in the middle turns around, goes out, goes home, takes all the stuff that he had in his house, whatever it is, his pornography, whatever, he trashes it and burns it and says, I'm on for God now. That was repentance. The other people go home and go, I just, I'm having a hard time trying, I just can't get rid of this in my life. It didn't change. Okay, so it's not, although true repentance can involve tears, and we've seen people, I, when I came back, I cried. I mean, yeah. Because in a lot of the tears were because of just God's goodness, more than anything. They just loved me so much. It was phenomenal. Um, okay. So, Here's the cool one too. Okay, the exhortation now. Here comes the other part of the sandwich. Kind of joke is. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. The deeper truths, that, as they call them, depths of Satan. Meaning, well, like, if I can really get close with Satan and get into evil, maybe I'll understand him better. That's one of the theologians. But actually, I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. And I like this. God always has a remnant. I was thinking of the 7,000 that didn't bow to Baal. Okay? He always has a remnant that stays faithful to him in the midst of temptation and severe trials. Just like in the Old Testament, not everyone in Thyatira followed the Jezebel spirit and got caught up in sinful behavior and false teaching. They remained true to the Lord. What did it cost him? I don't know. Think about the Christians in Rome when they would come up and say, you deny Christ or you're going to die. And they go, we're not going to, I'm not denying my master. And they went and tied him to a pole and they got ate by lions. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> or the three that were thrown into the fire. Or, da you know, Daniel. Look at all of them. They didn't, they remained faithful. They, hold, they held tightly to their beliefs. Okay? So in the Christian faith, it is not how we start, but how we what? Finish. Okay? Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still hardened against God. I mean, every day while it's still today, so none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. What a promise. Okay? Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. 
I love this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but let us encourage one another, especially now that the day of return is drawing near. Okay? Stand firm in it. Okay. Why do we do that? He doesn't end there. You know, he, just, he doesn't just say, okay, hold tight, hold tight. He, 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 he holds out the carrot stick. Okay? He gives you the reward. This is what, if you hold on tightly, this is your promise, this is your reward. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. We must keep our eyes on the prize. Okay? Very important. Okay? And I've always liked this scripture out of Hebrews. <clears throat> it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose, I wish the Thyatarians would have done that, huh? <laughs> he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt or to belong to the guild or to compromise my biblical principles for Egypt, for he was looking ahead to the great reward. Yes. Man, we need that. And that's why I like to be together as believers on Sunday. And we meet on Wednesday morning and we just encourage one another. Amen. Constantly be keeping ourselves accountable. The discipleship groups, we're looking to the reward. And we know that we've got a long road ahead of us. And we've got battles that we've got to fight. And we, but we got a God who's behind us, and he keeps saying, look to the reward, look to the reward. And what's neat is not only are we looking at the reward, we're not walking it alone. He's right with us, Hallelujah. saying, look, I'm your victory, I'm your power, you're an overcomer, and you're going to reach that reward. Just stay close to me. And so we will reign with Christ. And this is speaking of the millennium. And... Uh, he says, you are worthy to take the scroll and, and break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. After God comes back, we come with him. We get to become a kingdom of priests and the authority of Christ, and we will reign over the world with him. What a promise that is, huh? Then I saw thrones, and people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. And they had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or their hands. They all came again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. For the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. And lastly... We will be given the morning star. Jesus said, I am. This brings tears to my eyes because this means we get him. We got some of him now. He's in us, but we're going to get to see him what? Face to face. We get the morning star. If that's not enough of a promise for us. Okay. Jesus will appear for his own for those belonging to him, the true Christians. He will return in power and glory. We will finally share in his glory. The day will finally dawn, and Christ, the morning star, will completely fill our hearts. Amen. Amen. So, as you can see through Thyatira tonight, he was speaking to the church, but he had a lot to say to us in our walk. Okay? I think the Holy Spirit has exhorted us, challenged us, 
Now we just need, we've heard it. Now we need to let it take root. Hear with our ears. Receive with our heart. And I just pray, let's keep our eyes on the prize. Yeah. Right?